Well, hey there, guys. We are live on the streaming, on the air, on the whatever you call this internet place. I don't know yet if this stream is making it to you. I'm hoping it is. But uh, yeah, here we are. This is the first ever Left Coast uh, live stream. So I'm really, really looking forward to this. And I've been to a few webinars where they take like 15 to 20 minutes to kind of start diving into some content because, you know, they're waiting for everyone to trickle in. And I didn't uh, I didn't want to punish you guys who are here nice and early. So I'm going to start off with answering any questions that you have right away. Uh, I'll dive into those and answer one or two right off the top. Awesome. Good audio. Good to hear. It's about a 15 second delay, just so you know, but I can see the chat. <laughs> this is uh, this is pretty crazy. I uh, I had a friend who started live streaming his podcast by video. Oh, that must have been just just over a year ago now. And uh, always hearing about the little little things that can go bad made me nervous to ever try something live. But I'm willing to figure it out with you guys as we go. So thanks for being here. Yep, I am back. Awesome. So the failed films before this one, no one ever talks about this. One thing that uh, I talked about with Untethered is that this is my first film ever. Like this is my first film. And that's true, and that's also not true. Uh, it's true because this is the first like story that I've produced beginning to end that's actually a story that I feel is worth sharing and that I'm like presenting to the world as like a film. So in that sense, it's very much my first film. But there is probably close to five films that came previous to this one that were complete and utter failures. A lot of them actually didn't even, I didn't even really start shooting which is pretty embarrassing and when I think back to what my big problems were with some of those first ones is I had a lot of heart um, I had a lot of passion behind I was what I was trying to do and the stories I was trying to share and I had a lot of good intentions but I did not have the the experience or the skills or even just the the time or the space to actually devote my attention to bringing them to life so there's about three or four documentary projects that I seriously considered and I like wrote pages on I even like one of them I started an Indiegogo campaign and uh, you know I really did care about trying to bring these films to life and I didn't and so after about the third or fourth and fifth one that I had kind of had the great idea it's an awesome idea and then I never did anything about it I started to get discouraged and so I, I brought it back a level or two and I decided if I do something next, I want to focus on it being five to 10 minutes and I'm going to do it when I have the space in my life to do so. Uh, so that brings us to uh, this this spring. Uh, this spring was the first time in my life that I was jumping into filmmaking full time. To that point, it had all been on the side freelance stuff. Um, I worked a full time job for two years working for this leadership program. I did a leadership program. And so this was the first time where it was my full-time thing. Excuse me. And I was so looking forward to it, but I was really scared that if I tried to just like jump into starting my business, I wouldn't get any business. So I was really nervous about that. And I didn't want to have to just like accept all sorts of wedding, wedding. See, I went and said wedding. I don't want to have to accept all sorts of projects, especially not things like wedding projects, because those aren't the types of things that I wanted to be doing with my summer. And thankfully for me, I'd met some some two fellows individually, uh, well, together. I met two guys, Ryan and Josh, and they run a production company in downtown Vancouver. And over two years, I kind of made myself known to them. I would message them on the internet and kind of just ask some questions. And I kind of tried to put it on their radar, just kind of like plant a little thought in their head. Hey, when I'm done this full-time job, I would love to come work for you guys. And I sought them out. And I made my case that I would be a great addition to their team for a summer. And I told them I was willing to work for a little money. If they would bring me on their team, let me come right alongside them. If they would treat me you know, with respect and actually trust me to do things. And that was kind of the agreement we made. I didn't want to be an intern. And so we decided to call me an apprentice. So I was an apprentice with these guys. So that's what brought me to Vancouver. So I was living in downtown Vancouver, working for these guys. And a majority of my time was spent doing projects for them. We would do probably three or four shooting projects a month. And so, you know, those were only about two days long or so. And the rest of the time was studio time where I'd be editing for them. And 
I knew out of the summer I wanted to walk away with having made one thing that I was proud of. And I wanted to, so here's the three things that I wanted out of my summer. I didn't want any debt. I wanted a crap ton of experience and I wanted to make a film that I was proud of. And in my head at that time, it was about a 10 minute film. That's the, that's the bracket that I was thinking. So I was on the lookout for a story all the time. I was like, man, anything that moved, I was like, can I make a story about that? Like, could, could I tell this? Could I share this? And I was like on the, you could say I was definitely on the hunt. So being a slackliner myself, I met the slacklining community in Vancouver, uh, not the characters in my film, but I met some slackliners and they told me to join a Facebook group uh, where they share where certain slacklining things happen. So I joined the group and uh, I showed up at one of the events that was a highlining event. And that was the first time that I met the highliners. And that really blew my mind. That was the first day actually that I ever shot with a red camera too. Uh, if you're curious what cameras I shot this film with, I put a blog post together about that at leftcoast.co uh, because the majority of it actually wasn't shot on red. But I had an opportunity to use this red dragon camera and I was testing it out, getting familiar with it. And that day was that day was a gong show. I failed at so many things. It was pretty crazy. I forgot my monitor cable on the bus on the way to the highlighting thing. I formatted a card after I had started shooting. Uh, but what I walked away with from that first day was having met Spencer Seabrook, uh, which is the main guy in my film. And it became really obvious to me before I even knew, when I first met him, I didn't know what he all did as far as his free soloing stuff. I did not intend to make a, a film about free soloing. That wasn't what I set out to do. I was trying to make a film about human experience and people who are who are ordinary people that are doing extraordinary things. That's kind of what I wanted to do. So I met these guys and I realized right away the community was just insane. Uh, insane in the way that they are so welcoming to the people that they would bring in. I was like, this is so special. This is such a diverse group. And they had things like these free Facebook group that anybody can join and find out where to slackline. And this was like really cool for me to see. And I needed community in Vancouver, so I wanted to dive right in. And that's where I was like, this could be a really cool like microdoc story. And I picture a microdoc being in the like five to 10 minute range. So I asked Spencer if I could make a film about him. And uh, he pretty much told me, he told me you can like join, join the line because there's a lot of people that want to film and yeah. So pretty much join the line and, uh, and that was it. And that was the first day that I met Spencer. He told me, yeah, okay, you want to film? What, whatever there's lots of people that want to film like okay whatever Spencer left that day and uh, that's when I shot that first interview you see in the film uh, with Adam Mertens actually it's not the first interview you see but it's the interview with the blonde guy and uh, that interview was shot that first day and <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing with the red camera but somehow I walked away with that first interview and I talked with Adam actually for about two hours it was pretty it was a pretty intense interview and I learned in that conversation pretty much everything that set the foundation going forward I was just extremely curious of this community and how it came about and who is Spencer and what are Spencer's goals wait Spencer Spencer free solos are you kidding me like why does he free why does he free solo what is his goals with free soloing so that was that first interview with Adam that was the first day and that that was back in June and from that I was like okay I walked away from that and I could not stop thinking about the story. I could like not stop thinking about how cool that community was. And I knew I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to make this happen. So I'm going to dive into the next section kind of of this, uh, this little chat here. And that is how I self-funded my film. Uh, I want to talk about how you can pay for a film because I found this story that I was super passionate about. I found this story and I really wanted to share it. And to that point, I didn't have any personal invested money that I could just pay for it up front. I also, and this is key, I did not have enough camera gear to pull it off. And you say, what's enough camera gear? At that point, I did not have uh, a big enough computer to edit on. I did not have the proper audio gear uh, and I just had like my Canon 60D DSLR and I didn't have any audio gear. And that was a problem if you're making a documentary. And so I want to talk about how I made this happen. But first, I'm going to kind of explain several other methods that you can get your documentary paid for. 
Uh, sponsor funded documentaries seems to be one of the most common ways that I see like funded films happen in sort of the filmmaking documentary space. And when you see a documentary and it's kind of like brought to you by or sponsored by at the beginning, usually what happened was that filmmaker has a relationship with, oh dear, that just made a sound. <laughs> if you didn't know this, I'm actually so distractible. So my apologies. I was talking about, usually a filmmaker develops a relationship with a streaming company and, uh, and not a streaming company. <laughs> Usually a filmmaker develops a relationship with a sponsor of some sort, a company, and there's a story that they want to tell. And the sponsor ahead of time, uh, you develop a treatment of what the story could be. Either the sponsor has a few ideas or you have a few ideas and you develop this treatment and you share it with the sponsor and you share what the film's going to be and what your vision is for it and how you're going to release it and kind of all these things. And you break it down, you tell them how much it's going to cost. And then a sponsor either fronts the bill for the entire thing or fronts a bill for the majority. And then you can kind of get these sub sponsors. And this is a whole world of sponsorship that I actually know nothing about because I didn't get a sponsor for my film because I frankly didn't know how, because I ran into this problem where I knew if I devoted myself to making a film, it would be good. <laughs> it would be better than anything I had made to that point. And so when I wanted to approach sponsors, I was realizing I don't have anything to show them to take me seriously. And I don't want to waste my time trying to just like get cash to make this happen. Like I could, I could have wasted so much time just sending off emails to all these different people at different companies. And I had no leads because the slacklining world doesn't have established sponsored athletes in Vancouver. So these guys that are doing this, it's their hobby. They're like paying for it themselves. So, I realized pretty quickly that on the front end, because usually you get a sponsor on the front end, I was not going to be able to do that method. And uh, so the next method that you could do, and uh, this is the one that I see people do and I strongly discourage, uh, it's borrow money. I mean, I've seen some posts on forums and stuff where someone shares a film and they say, max out my credit card making this film worth every penny, like best decision ever. And I can't tell you how thankful I am to have this whole project done wrapped out on the internet and not be a penny in debt, not have any money that I owe to a credit card company because of this film. And that's a really, really good film. That's a really, really good feeling. So that brings us to number three, and this is the option that I chose. So if you have money up front, that's kind of a no brainer. You can invest your own money in making a film. What I chose to do was work almost full time. I was working probably three quarter, three. It's confusing because my hours were so spread out, but I was working about 40, 45 hours a week uh, for this company that I was apprenticing with. And all the money that I was making from that, I would pay for the basic expenses I had. I kept expenses. <laughs> I lived, I lived like a dirt bag. Honestly, I, I lived so simply. I took all the money I was making and just like put it directly into, uh, into my film. So it, as you can see here, the the three little methods, uh, sponsor, borrow, self-funded. So I took all the money I was making and it was, it was really scary, actually. It, there's no point of this that I was like, man, this is totally not scary because I went into the summer with no like emergency fund. And this is where I can't recommend you to do the same. It ended up working out for me, uh, but I took a big risk and that was not building up a cash pillow if things went wrong. Uh, I pictured if things went wrong, I would just move back into my parents' house. And uh, I can't recommend you to do that unless you feel confident that you could, you know, get your life back on track if suddenly something crashes and burns. So literally month to month, I was taking all my money and putting it back into the film, which ended up you know, months, it was very frequent that my bank account would get down to around 50 bucks. And that is, that is a scary feeling, but I knew that this project was potentially the most important thing I would be doing in the next like very short future. And I did not want to compromise on quality or results just because I did not have the money to do so. So that's how I approached the self-funding aspect of it. Um, if you have questions about the funding component, uh, let me know in the chat. It's cool to see that you guys are engaging in there. Um, I'm stoked that uh, Slack Life BC uh, likes my haircut. But uh, I'm going to move into kind of the things 
that I was thinking about when I was looking for the story when what you want to, so when I met Spencer and the guys and I realized that this was a film that I wanted to make, uh, it became very important to me uh, to make sure that I actually was able to pull it off. And one of the biggest flaws with those previous films that I tried to do, the ones that I talked about at the beginning, these four or five films that I just like had the vision for and they just like completely flopped. I think the biggest mistake I was making with some of those is my vision was too big. My vision was like absolutely ginormous. Um, And it just wasn't possible for me to pull it off with my skill level, with the equipment I had, with... It was, I mean, I was thinking like feature length documentary type stuff. I pictured myself being this like 16 year old prodigy filmmaker that makes these crazy documentaries. And I I feel no shame in sharing that because that's really what I felt was going to happen. And it didn't happen. And I was really humbled. And what changed with my approach to Untethered is I realized right away I had to narrow my focus immensely. Now, when you watch Untethered, it might seem kind of obvious. Of course, make the film about Spencer. Of course, include Michael. Of course, include Freedy. That might seem really obvious. When I met the slacklining community, that was like the furthest thing from obvious. There was so many people. And to think, man, who should I be including in this film? Like, who do I include? I. It was so much. So initially, I was realizing I have to narrow this down because there's too many people at these Highline meetups to kind of just film everything because I couldn't just show up and just film, just like film beginning to end and just film everything. That's not the method that I chose. I knew I had to focus in on several individuals. So I went on one or two more scouting trips where I'd go out to where these guys were highlining. Uh, I went to the chief for the first time and was made aware of how crazy that hike is. Man, that hike is that hike is next level. It's like an hour and 45 minutes of stairs for someone in my physical condition. And it's like so hard. But I went up and I kind of just like sessed things out and just kind of just was filming a little bit, not much, but kind of just getting an awareness of who is kind of the more interesting people, what make up this community. And Spencer was the only given uh, from that first day that I met him. It was obvious that he is the leader of this group and his passion for it was so tangible. And that's one of the things that really you need if you're trying to share a person through film is they need to be passionate. Uh, This is something that's so crucial because if they lack passion, if they lack this deep driving motivation, if they don't relentlessly pursue what they do, it's going to be so hard to make them seem and come alive over a film. And Spencer was obviously like the most driven out of any of them. It was just, it was a no brainer. And I chose the drivenness over the skill. And it's easy for me to say this because Spencer was one of the most driven and the most skilled. Uh, But even if Spencer wasn't the most skilled, I, I'm fairly certain I still would have wanted to focus in on him because of the instrumental role he was playing in helping to teach others and, uh, and also just, you know, share with the community. And so if you're trying to make a documentary, if you want to make a story, I really recommend narrowing down your focus to one person to begin with. Uh, try focusing on one person, one context, and one main storyline that they're trying to accomplish. My main storyline at the beginning was community. That was what I approached from the beginning. I wanted this community story arc. Uh, and so because I put these these Uh, restraints on my project I think that's really what allowed it to start to excel and that's really what made me uh, be able to actually have mobility and clarity going forward of how to make this project happen and to further things I even limited the shooting days and so I decided you know we're only going to shoot the first section of this film uh, in five days so we did we scheduled the five-day trip and that's where pretty much the entire film except for one or two scenes was filmed and this was important because the highlighting world progresses so incredibly because, I mean, the highlighting Oh, man, that's super awkward. I'm, uh, I'll keep my who it is. This is just what happens when you share. How, my huge apologies for it going out like that. It should be good to go now. Um, man, that's embarrassing. Uh, it's good to go now. <laughs> 
Cool. Yeah, we're back. That's uh, that's crazy. Um, what does your professional work look like? Actually, my professional work, a majority of my income, uh, if you're curious, I have no problem sharing real numbers. I'm a real numbers kind of guy. So I was working a full-time job till May, uh, and that full-time job paid me... Uh, didn't pay me very much, uh, under a thousand dollars a month, and they covered my my living and my food, so that wasn't like I needed a whole lot. Uh, but in between May and December, I made twenty five grand. Uh, so that was in ways more than I had planned, but also still not that much. Uh, so twenty five grand is the most I've made in a year in my life. Uh, but it also, as far as like a full time working professional, it's not that much of a wage. And that's kind of just a balance where I was working as an apprentice for this company. And so I was a subcontractor, but they kind of decided the rates and I kind of worked in and with that, which is totally fine. And that worked out for that system. But I make a majority of my month to month income from editing videos. Uh, one of the clients that I edit for, uh, Brad Friesen, he runs a YouTube channel, uh, some pretty cool helicopter stuff. You can look up Brad Friesen on YouTube. Uh, incredible things. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's what I do for professional work, and I the reason why I don't do my own productions very frequently for clients is I'm trying to keep my calendar as clear as possible for that big project coming up, and this is this is scary. Yeah, it's scary, uh, but through editing, I'm able to sustain myself for now, and I don't want to just fill up the schedule with all these like random nothing projects. So my month to month income right now in the new year is actually very, very low, but I'm not going to just fill up my schedule with a bunch of random things. I'm going to hold out for that awesome project that I'm still, still waiting for, but, uh, hopefully it will happen. So that's kind of the, the answer on the professional work that I do. Hopefully that helps. Uh, I really dig how. Uh, untethered is organic uh, how much of the story was planned and how much of it just came about from keeping an open mind that's a that's a really great question uh, the first section of filming we did was five days that's uh, kind of the majority of what you see that includes almost that includes the rigging of that massive line on the chief that's going up the chief that's the water line uh, that's the rope that's not the rope swing the rope swing was done later but we went up there and we just started filming stuff as it happened. And I really wanted this feeling to the film where it felt like the viewer was coming along and spending time. I, uh, I tried to get like sort of these natural organic looking interviews on the side of the cliff. And I started just kind of doing these in and through. And while I was doing these, I did a lot of them actually that didn't make it into the film, but I started to get a grasp of what the story could be. Uh, and so I started pulling in this this storyline of community and how when people do things together, they can go further. That's kind of one of the sub themes where, you know, Michael, this guy who's been doing it for three months, progressed so fast because he's with the right people. And uh, that storyline really got developed over just spending time with them. So that wasn't planned. But after that first five days of B-roll shooting, I went back and I had not shot the interviews at this point. And I sat down and I cut, I cut, almost all the B-roll into what I call select sequences. And I made them into these different segments. So I would edit, edit all the, the lake footage and I'd make it into this like micro segment on my timeline. I'd edit the rigging of this line. I'd edit Michael on a line. I'd edit Freedy on a line. I'd edit Spencer on a line. And I made all these micro sequences and I mapped it out in a program called MindNode Pro. And I just put all those little blocks and then sub things of what those blocks were about. And I just tried to get a, a bird's eye view of what, could the story arc be? Because if you're making a, a film, it needs to have an arc. It needs to have progression. One of the things that makes a story interesting is conflict. This is one area of filmmaking that I need to continue to grow. And one of the things I was most worried about when making this film is conflict. You know, what is the main character trying to do? What is their motivation? What are they coming up against? What is their what you know this is the stuff you probably learned back in english class in high school you know person versus person person versus nature person versus self those are all different types of conflict and you need to harness conflict in your films in order to actually make it interesting and to like carry the viewer along in the story so i looked at this as a whole and i realized dude uh i don't really have conflict in this this is just a bunch of fun little snapshots uh but right now this is just like a look into their world it's not a story beginning to end 
And this was something I was learning as I was doing it because I really did not know much about storytelling or storytelling theory. Uh, but I was taking a course from, oh my goodness, Still Motion. They're, they have a, a website called Learn Story. And uh, I started taking one of their courses. I paid a lot of money for it. I actually haven't finished it. But through the first module, I only did the first module, I learned that you know my film really has to have an interesting character and there's gotta be a conflict uh, that exists within a space and a time. And that's what really motivated me to, to try find conflict. At this point, the world record was not set. I need to come out and say that. Uh, so that kind of unveils something about the film. Uh, the world record was not set during those first five days of filming. Um, so I only had this footage and it, it had some free solo, but it was I was looking at this film about community. And so I was trying to find the conflict that could sort of drive the story. So one of the like motivating things moving forward was setting that 133 meter line. So there's kind of that small story thread where you're sitting on the side of the cliff with them as they're rigging that line. Um, that's one of the conflict points that I try to utilize to carry the viewer along. Um, but it wasn't until like a month and a half into editing that I was on a sailing trip and I was far as you could be at a cell phone range. And I came back from the trip and my phone had four missed calls from Spencer. And I was like, oh no, like, like, like what did I miss? Cause you know, when you get a phone call from Spencer, usually he's doing something rad. And, uh, so I called him and he had set the world record. And so I, you know, so excited for him. I did not think it was going to happen that soon. I didn't even know it was on his mind that much, but I was like, did anybody film it? And uh, thankfully, uh, one of the guys from Whistler that had partnered on a previous segment of the film, Zachary Moxley, had been there to film the drone footage. So now I had a film about community and a snapshot into a week up on a mountain. And I had this world record that just happened. And I was realizing, okay, I really need to include that world record in this film because it's, it's, it's crazy and it really is in ways like the perfect visual and tension based climax for this film. Uh, so I went back and I jotted down all these notes cause I still had not shot the interviews for this film. And I took all these notes of how to progress the conflict in the story. And I did two separate interviews with Spencer. I did one and tried to get all these conflict points edited together that interview, realized I missed stuff. And I went back and did another interview. That's the interview in the purple shirt. As I was realizing more, what could be the storyline? Uh, I really hope that uh, that makes sense of that progression. But I shot the B-roll, then took tons of notes trying to figure out what the the storyline could be. And I edited together the B-roll into these chunks trying to realize what the progression could be, both visually and also just like the motivation of the characters. And then uh, after I did that, I went and shot the interviews and really tried to kind of get these things linked up off of what things he had already said to me. Because uh, I really wanted to share the slacklining voice to them. Okay, so uh, now we're going to jump into poster giveaway uh, just because I realized that we're like 40 minutes into the stream and uh, and uh, yeah, and so let's take this link over here. Oh man, this is hilarious. I'm loving this. This is, thanks for coming along for this, guys. This is pretty crazy. So I have the link here, the unwatched link of Untethered on YouTube and I'm going to post it in the chat here. Um, if you would like to win an untethered poster, if an untethered poster is something that you want in your life, uh, I'll show you this poster here and I'm gonna share the story behind the poster. So here's here's the poster. This is just a mock size to show you. Uh, it's actually a full size poster. If you've seen any of my vlogs, it's a full size poster in the vlog, so it's a lot bigger. But this is the poster here. I'll hold this up nice and close, you know, getting really high tech here. Uh, and what you can see here is this is an image of Spencer uh, during that free solo world record walk. Uh, and uh, I had this drone image and I wanted to use it as a poster for the film, but it wasn't high enough resolution to print off big. So I hired a digital painter and he did this amazing digital painting of this scene, which you can see right here. Super excited about how it turned out. And uh, I printed off a bunch of posters for the premiere because I wanted to do it with excellence and just, I mean, I, I made no money from the premiere. <laughs> I actually lost a little bit. But I really wanted it to be epic. And so those are the posters. And I'd love to give one away to you guys. Uh, so I dropped a link into the chat there. You can see it uh, and you can follow through to it. And it's untethered on YouTube. So if you would like 
to win an untethered poster today. What you can do is share the film quick on social media and share in your post what inspired you about it or what you're inspired to do in the future. Just kind of share what your feelings are walking away from that film. Now share that on, I guess you could kind of do any social platform. And that's not really that important to me. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you want to do <laughs> or wherever. You're, if you don't want to spam your audience, you can do it wherever you don't want to spam your audience. That's fine with me. Uh, take a screenshot of that and then email it to Levi at leftcoast.co along with a question. So that's just, this is kind of the stuff that's more important to me. I would love to hear from you uh, a question on the making of the film because uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about something that's launching today that I'm really excited about, and I'll get to that. Uh, but your questions are crucial. So your questions are really, really important, and I'm going to tell you about this right now. Starting next week, Thursday, uh, for every Thursday from there, I know I've been talking about these tutorials forever, but tutorials are going live every Thursday for the next couple months. So just let that sink in. <clears throat> so I've been producing tutorials already, writing all the scripts for them. I haven't, uh, I haven't finished too many because what is really important to me is hearing the questions that you guys actually have. So I'll give you a little context. I'm doing a series on how to edit a documentary, which is, you know, the processes that I talked about, about editing your B-roll footage, uh, taking your B-roll footage, making notes from it, shooting your interviews, editing your interviews, and then tying together those B-roll segments with the interview footage. This was a process that I learned so much from while making this film. And man, I could have saved so much time off the front and if I just kind of implemented some of these simple techniques. Uh, but that's one series that I'm going to do, and that's kind of editing a documentary. But kind of it's, it's, really, it's really open as far as the other tutorials. So I'd love to love to hear from you, your questions. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do stuff on color correction, but there's this perception about me that I know a lot about color correction and I'm okay with that perception. That perception's totally, totally fine with me. Uh, but the reality is I don't know a ton. And uh, the individual who graded my film uh, knows a lot more about color correction than I do. So we're going to try to shoot a tutorial or two, uh, but he is really advanced. And it's hard to break down color theory into bite-sized chunks. And he uses DaVinci Resolve, which I'm not assuming a lot of you guys use. Uh, and so I want to try to find maybe a way that even though we graded in DaVinci Resolve, maybe, maybe I can convince Ryan to share with us just a few quick tips on color grading. Um, so, yeah, you can uh, send away, uh, share away that link that I put into the, the chat. Uh, still tons of time to get those in. I'm going to randomly select one of those emails here at the end of the show. And uh, yeah, I'd love to, it'd be, it'd be pretty funny if no one submitted at all. Uh, I doubt that's going to happen, but I will mail it to you. I will do that. I'll actually, uh, if we get enough, I might give away two. So that's maybe a bit of an incentive there for you. But yeah, that's kind of the vision for the next couple months. It's been hard to start the tutorials because I want them to be really good quality, but I'm making progress and they're going to, the next, the first one is coming out next Thursday. And I'm really excited to make this stuff for you guys just because it means so much to me to give back to the community because I've been so poured into by other people that have taught. Um, some of the people that I've really looked up to over the years are guys like Chase Jarvis. He's taught a lot about photography and just arts and he just gives, he just gives and gives and gives and gives and so inspiring to me. And Shane Hurlbut, he's another individual that gives and gives and gives. Um, another person that gives and gives is uh, the still motion people. And they're the people who I've done their storytelling course. I haven't done it. I've started. I plan to finish that someday. And uh, so those people are huge inspirations and I'd love to be able to, to give back in my own way. And this has been so important to me. So... Caleb is saying it would be rad if Ryan's color grading is advanced to see his workflow and color grading session. Yeah, I think we'll probably do a two-part uh, video that shows how did he grade on Tether. So this will have advanced jargon in it. It's not going to explain theory. It's going to explain how did he do what he did and kind of just go through it real quick. 
Uh, and so that will kind of be how he went through DaVinci Resolve, the different nodes that he used, how we used film convert, how we matched the cameras. Uh, but that will all be on a, on a basis of if you have color grading knowledge, because he won't have time to explain what each thing means. But then hopefully we can follow up with uh, a t tutorial or two that is on the more basic level uh, afterwards. And hopefully that's some theory that you guys can then apply and build up off of. So right on. I'm, I'm just waiting for uh, waiting for some of that stuff to come in. I'm, I'm waiting for the emails, guys, waiting for those screenshots. I mean, if there's like a massive delay, there's not a massive delay. It should be only 15 seconds. Our, our quality is still good. Um, yeah, this is really cool. I'm, I'm really thankful that it's been streaming steady, hopefully for the last little bit. Uh, if it's not, you can let me know. But um, yeah, do you guys have any other questions? I mean, I've, I've now asked you to email me a question and I've uh, asked you to share it on social. So that's totally okay if you don't have a question to throw at me in the chat right now. Um, I can think of a story to share. Oh, <laughs> you guys are going to love this. Uh, I crashed a drone during the making of this film. <sighs> I crashed a drone. I crashed a drone. I crashed a drone. Um, I crashed a drone on the day that we were filming at the waterfall. And this was, this was the day also that we carried a string across the gully <laughs> with the drone, which was uh, slightly irresponsible. Uh, that day I had looked on Amazon prime because the drone I was using was actually a borrowed setup. And two days later, the individual who I was borrowing it from needed to leave to Africa with it. So I really needed to make sure that he had a drone back in his hands on Friday morning and it was Wednesday and we were at the waterfall and they were asking if I'd be willing to take the string across with the drone. And, uh, I agreed to it because Amazon prime could get me a drone in 24 hours if something bad happened. And I'm the kind of person that's willing to take risks to a calculated degree, even if it makes a good story. So we got the string across actually with the drone. It was pretty intense, but we got it across and, uh, Later that day, we were doing tons of filming and it was going really, really well. And I was filming right next to the cliff edge and Michael was getting out on one of these big high lines and you know, it was a it was a way bigger line than he had ever been on. So I was super stoked for him and he was actually standing up and I was like, no way, he's standing up. And as you're flying a drone, you go between your monitor and line of sight. And I primarily fly line of sight most of the time. And so that's where you're watching the actual drone in the air to make sure you're not crashing but you go in between line of sight and your monitor. So I'd been doing line of sight, lining it up uh, sort of in the physical space that I wanted it to be. And then I looked at my monitor and right as I looked at my monitor, the feed kind of like flickered and then just cut out because we had this like super ghetto transmitter that was like double sided taped to the bottom of it. I didn't know the tape was loose. I didn't even know much about the setup. The tape had come undone, the transmitter fell, got like caught my stream stopped and I'm looking at the monitor and I'm like, Oh my goodness, my stream just stopped. A gust of wind comes. All of a sudden I hear like, I was just like, I look up to the left and uh, the drone just like falls right in front of me, hits the cliff edge and just like tumbles right over the cliff. And I was just like, Oh no. Yeah. So the drone went over the cliff and I was like, okay, just got to go down there and get the drone hustling down the hill run around the corner you know just like hustling so hard trying to make sure that this drone doesn't get too wet because it's a waterfall and uh i find the drone instantly it's you know it's a big white drone but the gimbal had broken off the gimbal had broken off and i was like oh my goodness this is the worst because in my head even if i had to buy a new drone the footage i was getting that day to me was worth thousands of dollars so I had no issue at that point, knowing that we had gotten amazing footage, uh, buying a new drone, <laughs> but we needed to find the footage, which was attached to the gimbal, which I didn't know where it was. 
So Spencer actually came down and helped me as well. And I need to say that waterfall is the most intense waterfall I've ever experienced up close in my life. So I'm like trying to see, I got like my hat pushed down because the spray is just like intense. And I had just a tank top on and I was getting so cold and I'm like looking for this and it's a little black thing and I couldn't find it anywhere. And I was getting so stressed and I was just like slowly, just like the tension was just building. And I was like, man, man, don't know where the drone is. Don't know where the drone is. And, uh, we're like 45 minutes into looking for it. And all of a sudden Spencer's like, yeah. And he's like yelling. Yeah, and I turn over and he's got the gimbal in his hand. And it was just like the biggest endorphin release celebration moment of the shoot <laughs> for me. I was so excited to get it back. Um, so got back to the car later that day and ordered a new drone. And uh, cause that one was definitely done. It was done skis. It was so broken. <laughs> so broken um i got a question about vlogging mr dan says how are you finding keeping up with vlogging levi i just started it's pretty tough vlogging is uh is hard and uh i mean there's some of these daily vloggers out there that really kill it and i can't imagine how much of their day they have to spend on that but I decided to start with one week at a time and that's kind of how I got into it. And I, I I didn't enjoy the one week thing because I mean, I would try film across multiple days, but then it was really hard to stitch that together into like a sequence that made sense. And so I decided I wanted to do more frequent. Uh, and so I jumped up to two times a week and I try to really contain a vlog filming to one or two days uh, just to not get, just so it's not too much content. Um, I'm enjoying it a lot. I mean, I really like creating things regularly. And the biggest motivator is just knowing that I want to create consistently. Um, and and that's like a huge motivator for me. Uh, but also just the, it's blown me away how encouraging people have found that, which I it's still hard for me to understand because, I mean, I'm really, yeah, it's just hard to understand how me sharing things from like, my life and my journey as a filmmaker could be like helpful. That's just like, yeah, I don't fully understand that. But the motivation that I get from people interacting in the comments and letting me know what it means to them is like huge. So that's a big driver as well. So, uh, so far two, two vlogs a week has felt manageable. Um, and I plan to continue that. And I think I'm going to keep up to a week along with the tutorial. So that's my plan. I've really been enjoying vlogging. Nicholas just said, sells drone on eBay, uh, <laughs> only used once. No, I didn't sell the broken drone. And it uh, it turned into a part drone, actually, for the the company that owned, owned it. And I just kind of replaced and gave them a new one. Lucas does said, have you ever considered working with any of the park parkour folks up in Vancouver? They are wonderful people and have great stories to tell. Uh, I'm, I haven't uh, reached out to anyone in the parkour parkour. Man, why did I struggle saying that word? Parkour. Parkour. <laughs> I haven't reached out to anyone yet. And at this point, I'm not actively looking for stories just because just because I'm trying to focus so much on the behind the scenes content. And I've already got a few other things that I'm trying to tease out. But I mean, I would always be open to, to meeting people. So, you know, if there's parkour, people that I want to meet. But that's one of the challenges and that's one of the biggest differences that has been made in my past year is being willing to say no and saying no has been the most like liberating thing for me. And I've said no to so many things and it, it, it feels bad. Sometimes you feel bad. I mean, with clients, they ask you, can you do this project? And you feel bad when you can't do it. And with friends and they want you to come to this thing, you know, and you can't do it. And if you're still watching this stream and you're trying to think about what would make the biggest difference for you, for making a passion project happen. This is where I'm going to get real. I'm going to lay the fire here. I'm going to back up and get ready. Uh, if you want to make a project happen, if this project is really important to you, if you're willing to self-fund this project, and if you don't want to make compromises and sacrifice on your artistic integrity, you have to be willing to say no and to live a life that looks different than what might be normal. You might have a vision of what you want your life to look like and of what you want, you know, I want to be able to go on so-and-so trips a week. I want to, you know, only work these hours. But 
in the early stages of your life, if you're trying to make a project or even even if you're far into your career, if you still haven't made a project you're proud of, you have to live for a time a lifestyle that's like no for now, but not forever. That's kind of what I kept telling myself. You know, I did not hang out with people this summer. I stayed downstairs in a basement studio for sometimes up to 14, 15, 16 hours a day. I love the outdoors. I love being outside. I hate being alone. I'm not an introvert. I'm an extrovert. Yet I spent 16 hour days alone. You don't need to do this. Uh, But in my case, that's what I needed to do in order to pull this off. That's what I needed to do in order to actually make this project something that I knew it could be. Because you get these visions in your head. And as you start working on the project, yeah, you need to, sometimes you you realize it's not going to maybe quite reach your vision. But you still got to push for that vision if you're going to be satisfied. I'm never satisfied unless I know I left everything on the table. And if I left everything on the table and the results did not turn out like I liked, I'm still satisfied because there's so much to learn from that. In this case, this was the first project that I left everything on the table and the things lined up and it worked out and I have a project that I'm immensely proud of. I've been told that I need to work in the film industry, work my way up and just like spend tons and tons and tons and tons of time working on other people's projects. And I've met people that are like well into the later years of their career. I'm not just going to like list ages because I don't think age is that important, but people that have been doing what they're doing for a while And they're like super regretful that they haven't made something they're proud of. And they like make these qualms about how you have to make client projects and you have to, you know, you got to make, got to make the money. You got to do those client gigs. And, oh, it's just like so sad because it's like sucking the life out of their passion. And it's just like, it doesn't, it's not sustainable. And in that path, you're not going to accidentally make something that you're proud of. This is not going to happen. You have to make a plan. You have to make a plan and make sacrifices and say no for now, not forever. I'm engaged. I've been engaged for eight months and me and my fiance were doing long distance and it was so hard. I mean, that was really, really challenging. But I realized this was the time of my life if there was any time that I could pull this off because as soon as I'm married, I now have another person who's one in my life And that's super important relationship that needs a lot of attention. And I don't think I could have given this documentary project as much energy as I did give it and self-fund it as I did if I was specifically married in that season and doing it the way I did it just because, I mean, I lived out of my van. Yeah, I lived out of my van to make it work. Uh, And I don't think that would have worked very well my first year married. (laughs) So that's kind of... I don't know if that's actually fiery or not, but I'm I'm really passionate about, it just makes me so sad when people, um, when people haven't made something they're proud of and when they think, you know, maybe one day, but they're not willing to actually take ownership of where their life is going. <clears throat> right on. So that's a little fire getting ready to do the draw. Uh, I got the emails coming in. I got your emails, guys. I got them. If you want to be included in the draw, you have about 30 to 40 more seconds before I randomly, randomly select a winner. So, so submit away. Nicholas says, is a tiny house next for the married life? Uh, we're going to start in an apartment. Just kind of try to find a place to rent. I'm a little nervous about finding an apartment just because I want space to be able to record videos and do stuff like that. But we're going to start in in an apartment probably for the first six months to a year and then kind of look at our options after that. A tiny house would be great. Who knows? I kind of need a studio and I need my studio to exist at home for now just because renting a studio space and an apartment just isn't an option for me. Trying to keep my overhead super low. So no, probably won't be living in a tiny house soon just because I need studio space. Okay. So I'm going to go over here, um, back to the poster giveaway slide. What up? So I'm, uh, I'm pulling it up here. I'm going to do this random selection out of the email. Um, if you haven't gotten yours in yet, 
get it in. There's a couple more seconds. Oh my goodness, this is so exciting. I feel like I need a co-host to like make things exciting when there's like a lull on the air. Okay, so just selected it here. I'm gonna write down the name. <laughs> Let's put this back up. Okay. Do do do. Yeah, I can actually beatbox. I got super distracted there and stopped talking, but I can beatbox uh, a little bit, not terribly well. So like I could like do like a swick, a sick beat uh, leading up to this. But uh, the winner of a signed untethered poster, this is the mini version. The one that you're going to get mailed is bigger, like full size. It's super cool. The winner is uh, Ben Altair. So Ben, you are the winner. Thank you so much for submitting and... Uh, yeah, I actually met Ben for coffee the other day and uh, the other day, like a month ago, <laughs> not the other day. I met, he reached out on the internet and uh, I met an internet person in real life. They, they exist and we had coffee and it was really cool. So I've been following him on Snapchat. Ben, you should throw your Snapchat in the, in the chat if you're still there uh, because he, well, he was just on a trip to India and those snaps were crazy. So Ben Altair, uh, thank you everyone for, for your submissions. This is this is pretty crazy, you know. Yeah, give give congrats to Ben, guys. That's what that's what Gary Vaynerchuk did on the live stream when people won. He's like, everyone say congrats. So say congrats. <laughs> uh, okay, I got another question here from Matt. How did you get other people really excited about this film, whether to help film or just be a part of it? I find it's tough getting people involved and then being reliable. Matt, it is tough getting people involved and then being reliable. This is true. The only other person uh, who helped uh, shoot the film for like a majority of it was my buddy RJ. And, you know, RJ is someone that I've built a relationship with. And there's kind of this standing understanding between us that, you know, I would have done the same for him if he wanted uh, me to come help him shoot a project. And that's something that you have to foster over time. And that's like trust that you build. I'm sure you could go out and shoot a project with someone that you just met. But for me and RJ, you know, we have been talking about film stuff. We've been growing together. So when I told him about this project, he was excited about it. We'd been talking about working on stuff for a long time. And uh, he was he was excited to get on board. And so he donated his time to the film. And uh, so that's kind of the main person who really helped as far as make the, the filming of it happen. Because I was primarily drone operating while I was up there. So I was flying away, which is so much fun. Oh my gosh, I love drone operating. And he was getting a lot of these like texture shots in in and few between, uh, not in and few, uh, just getting the texture shots and the B-roll shots. So that way it wasn't just all drone footage. Uh, so that's RJ. That was uh, the main person. Then another critical relationship was color grading. Uh, and Ryan agreed to color grade because he was excited about the project. He saw how excited I was and I worked for him. So I worked for him all summer. And so... I kind of just asked him and he was willing, which is super cool. And I don't really know the magic recipe that worked for that besides he's just a rad guy and he wanted to get involved. And that's like super cool and super, yeah, it's just a huge blessing to be able to meet people like that. And then another person that played a massive role was Zachary Moxley with some of his drone footage. And uh, thankfully through meeting him while shooting a couple times, you know, I had been friendly because I think you should be friendly with anyone you meet. Uh, there's no reason being hostile to other filmmakers you meet. And uh, and he agreed to let some of his drone footage be used in the film. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's how you find people. I don't really know, man. I'm trying to think about how to find people to hire for my company going forward. And that's a really challenging, stressful thing. Uh, but I guess just being... Okay. Yeah, another thing about filmmaking. Filmmaking is relationship. That's what it is. I mean, you can be an excellent shooter, but you really, really do need to. Um, you really do need to be a relational driven person, and be super willing to foster relationships of trust and meaning with people, all across the board. You know, those who help me shoot, those who help me color grade. You know, uh, the people in the film. It's all fostering relationship with them and just kind of developing this trust. And that is huge. Um, if you want to grow as a documentary filmmaker, grow in your relationships and your willingness to get to know other people, even if you're an introvert. I know some 
crazy, incredible, good filmmakers who are introverted, yet they can be driven relationally and they can put the relational hat on and get to know people and get and treat people like they're valuable because they are. That's key. You can't just be a snob. The only the only day I only regret one day uh, while filming, and I'm going to share that in a sec after I take a sip. I only regret regret one thing mainly while filming, and that was one day when we're at the waterfall. Uh, I was really stressed out because we were doing that rope swing. Uh, that was just kind of one day. We we're doing rope swing shots and. A GoPro had gotten turned off by someone uh, during Spencer's first swing. And so I didn't get the shot and I was stressed out and I was trying to get things set up for the next shot. And someone, someone asked, uh, asked if they could help. And I was just like, so focused. I was like, yes, no. And I like brushed them off and I just felt, yeah, I was super focused and like driven towards a task, but I did not take the time to be warm with this person. And later, you know, a few days later, I just like moment that really stands out. I was like, I wasn't being pretty embarrassed. I want, I want 